is that they're not lazy. It's, it's easy to send, anybody can send emails to 50, uh, to 50 VCs and it doesn't really show you anything. But somebody who actually takes the effort to actually get an introduction actually tells me that the founder really actually wants to work with us. And actually this is how they would approach a sales opportunity as well. They would try and get somebody to refer them into the company, which obviously increases their chance of success. So how you approach a VC is, I think is important. And people who come to office hours, that tells me, that tells me you want to learn and that you want to spend that bit of, that bit of extra effort in, in talking to us. So we're open to everything and we're pretty much everywhere. Um, but just remember it's how you approach us, which I think is the critical thing. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, so Will, do you want to add anything to that or? No, that was uh, totally agree. No more points. All right, okay. So moving on to the next question from Anonymous. Hi, whoever you are. So the question is, what is Cocoon's approach to portfolio management? And what are your advice for PCs who may not have prior operational experience in a startup? Advice to VCs? Yes, your approach in portfolio OK, management. advice to VCs that have no experience in startups is to get that, um, get that experience, I think. <laughs> um, I think that's, uh, that's uh, some people say that's, uh, those are some good things people say about us that, you know, we, we have previous experience from startups. Uh, the way we manage our portfolio, I think is probably in the, in the active end of the spectrum. Uh, we try to keep in touch with founders multiple times between board meetings. We, we obviously have, or we have monthly board meetings. That's not obvious. Um, some VCs prefer to have quarterly board meetings. We think it's really important to engage very closely with, with the founders. I mean, the whole point of us being there, although we are the dumbest, dumbest people in the room, as Michael mentioned, uh, is that we know a few things about governance and how to drive you, yourself towards Series A, right? That the main purpose of us as an investor is to make sure that you, the portfolio company, can raise a very nice Series A at a much higher valuation from the VC that will take the next steps with you, right? So therefore, we need to engage. Um, we try to engage basically across every area. I think um, where we are, where we don't know enough to actually engage, we use uh, third-party advisors. Um, and since we have been entrepreneurs, I think we can kind of empathize with how tough it is to be an entrepreneur. It's really lonely to be an entrepreneur. If you have a team of 20 and you're two founders, it's basically two of you that carry all that responsibility. I felt it myself when I was an entrepreneur and it was a very tough journey. Um, and I kind of can empathize with how entrepreneurs want uh, investors to, to treat them and, and be there for them. Uh, of course, I also went through that same experience myself. And, and, uh, and Michael was an entrepreneur as well. So, so I think that we, we try to be super active um, in portfolio management and dealing with entrepreneurs, but it's always, it always has to be driven by the entrepreneurs themselves. We cannot come and be super active from our point of view and then the entrepreneurs are not active back. It has to be a, a, a pull and not a push. I, I mean, the only thing I would say is that as at Cocoon, we, we're building a relatively small portfolio. So I think it's easier for us to be, uh, to be active on that side. If, yeah. if you are a fund uh, or running a fund that, that is, is going to have a larger um, portfolio, building a larger portfolio and doing deals uh, at a faster rate than we do, um, I think one of the most important things is communication. Be very clear or in terms of how you wish to communicate the details that you require, especially if you're a more passive investor, um, that you require from uh, the entrepreneurs. And don't overpromise promise um, what, what you're going to deliver. Um, when we invest, we're very clear on what, how much time and what we can actually deliver to founders. What we find founders get, sometimes get very frustrated is they bring an investor on They've made all these promises about who they could be introduced to, what support they're going to get, and then they don't actually uh, deliver. Um, and that's bad in terms of, it doesn't, it, it, it damages the re relationship you have with the entrepreneurs, which is absolutely critical. But also a lot of the, a lot of our deal flow actually comes from our entrepreneurs because they say, you know, Will and I, they're difficult and painful to work with, but they deliver on what they say they're going to do, you know? Um, and that actually then attracts other, um, other, other, other founders. And we get good quality people who know what they're, they're getting when they come to us. So um, I think it's just really important that it's just clear communication at the beginning. 
um, with the founders, what you're going to deliver, how you want to communicate going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So now we're going to answer more questions that is related to trends in the markets, especially during a time like this. So we have a question from Mohan, which is, uh, will there be more M&A activities during this period? And will it be mainly struggling startups getting picked up for cheap? Or is there something else do you think this is going to happen? Oh, uh, that's an interesting one. Um, I, 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 I've read a lot of articles which claim there's going to be a, a, an increase in M&A uh, activity. I... I think there will, I think will, there will be a, a few of the top end, maybe on the B two C, where you can see mergers happening, because they don't. Uh, a lot there's a lot of companies out there that have raised a lot of money, and actually not got a business model. And their assumptions have always been that there's always going to be more money at the end. You kind of like buy the market share, and you you know, um, and then you'll figure out how to make money. Um, it was very much thinking back in the dot com boom days which I would say um, has kind of reinvented itself over here. And I think there'll be a number of companies that um, have got such big burn rates, they're going to have to be, uh, I think that the acquisition there, and then there's a number of large brands, uh within Southeast, within the region um, that have, have got big war chests. I think in terms of the smaller deals, and if, if, I, if I look at our portfolio, I don't think there's going to be a huge uh, amount of M&A activity um at, at the lower level there's a you know quite often it happens because of the talent acquisition to be quite honest there's so much talent floating around at the moment um because so many people have been let go um if you're in a position of of, of uh, you know i've got a couple of companies that are actually hiring at the moment and they've never seen such good quality people and as, as one of them mentioned they're like yeah well, we're paying like two-thirds of what i would have normally have had to pay them because they're finding it hard to get a job because so many people have been let go. Um, so I, I think it, it's it's hard to, you, you know, if a company doesn't have a, you know, a business model that's working, um, they're either going to be bought for the talent, which could potentially be happening, or it could be because of the brand, if there's a strong brand out there. But I don't think it's something that we should be relying upon. I think what you'll find is you will see many more failures, um, which I don't think is actually a bad thing for the, ecosystem um good founders when they fail once they'll do it again very rarely do uh founders hit it big first time around uh, the problem is sometimes is that they stay too long with their first company because they don't want to let go um and it doesn't I, I think this is actually and those that just give up and then don't do another startup they probably won't true entrepreneurs just saw an opportunity they'll go for it but true entrepreneurs will come back again and again and again and i think experience of failure makes you stronger. I mean, trust me, I've had so many failures in my life. Um, the only, I don't, as long as I learn from them, I'm fine. I, the only time I get really upset and annoyed with myself um, is if I make the same mistake twice. Um, failure, I think, and, uh, and, and entrepreneurism are two words that are actually very strongly interlinked because entrepreneurism is all, all about pushing the boundaries um, I know we're getting slightly off topic here in terms of M&A, but I, I think it's a very simple, it's also a hard question to, to really answer. But I think uh, overall ecosystem, I think actually this is really going to, 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 to get out the you know, lifestyle entrepreneurs with the real entrepreneurs uh, going forward. And I think it's actually going to be good for the uh, ecosystem long term. Okay. Um, can, I, can I just jump in on the M&A question? Um, yeah. I... I my analysis, our analysis, I think, is that cross-border M&A will probably go down, right? Um, uh, a lot of the corporate venture capital funds, you can expect them to kind of be put on hold for a while because companies have to deal with their local issues and they have to reserve capital to keep their core business going. So I would assume that, you know, we have seen a huge rise in China-led M&A deals, uh, also in Southeast Asia. That would probably be delayed for a little bit, I would think. Uh, as Michael mentioned, I think in country m a or probably in region m a perhaps will take on a different uh, uh, form, but I don't really see a big pickup there either. Don't forget that m a activities is kind of still quite low in Southeast Asia though, right? So we're not starting from very high volume anyway. Anyway, 
let's have the next question, I guess. All right, okay. Okay, so we're moving on to the next questions. Uh, this is coming from Wilson and Vijay. Both of them are about valuation, especially during the COVID period. So how much lower are VCs valuing seed and Series A startups in this uh, period? And then has the valuation of seed stage startups dropped dramatically for those trying to raise? So what are your guys' thoughts on this? So, so our thought is that startup valuations are usually not always driven by logic or cash flows like you are taught in business school. So we've definitely seen that there is um, a price discount that's coming from prices, but we can talk about, we can look at a level right around 30% perhaps, or 20, 30%, but fundamentally, I think prices for startups are driven by how much the startup is raising. And if a founder comes and wants to give away 40 or 50% of his or her company to us, we probably wouldn't be interested because we think in the long term, it's really important that the founder is motivated by his or her shareholding. So if a deal is too good, it, it's, it's just not attractive. So it's a kind of a funny mechanism. So what typically would happen, I think, in a crisis is that companies will raise less funds, even though they probably should raise more. And they would probably get a slight, uh, see a slight discount in terms of valuation, but nothing super dramatic because that's just not possible in, in, the, in the mathematics of startup fundraising. So that means that they have to basically save and develop more slowly in the beginning. Uh, when it comes to how much money they should raise, I think we generally ask companies to raise for 18 months. I think now we probably want to see that they can survive 24 months. So it's a complicated question, actually, a complicated math. Okay. But no, I, t I totally agree with Will on that. Um, you know, I, I would say we normally look at getting around about 20% of a, a company when we invest. And, and it's dictated by the, the valuation is then dictated by the amount uh, that they're raising. In the last couple of deals we've done, I think we've gone to like 23%. So uh, I don't think it, it's changed dramatically for us. I think where you're going to see some um, massive uh, valuation decreases are for actually like um, at the Series A, pre-Series A, Series A companies. Because um, over the last few years, there's been a lot of companies that have raised at, I would say, unrealistic and unsupportable valuations. Um, and they need to go to market uh, um, at that point and it's very hard so if you can't support the valuation um then you're going to have to do a down round and i'm seeing a lot of companies that have even you know uh have raised money already from other vcs coming to us um and actually having to you not in, us not even asking even just reducing the valuations and um, then it becomes extremely complicated because you get into the same problem that will mentioned earlier about the founders being becoming too dilutive um, and that's actually, if you talk to any later stage VC, that that's straight off off the point. If the on founders are being too diluted early on, it becomes uninvestable to them. All they've got to start doing all these weird and wonderful things to try and get the founders back up again and punish the early stage investors. So I think, you know, in answer to that question from, I think, Wilson was, yes, uh, I know, I don't think valuations at the C stage are going to uh, change dramatically or they haven't for us. I think pre-Series A, Series A, and Series B, I think a lot of companies, if they have to go out to market now, um, will probably be doing uh, down rounds. All right. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, right. So we're going to move on to the next question. Now, this is going to be about the strategies that startups are taking to face this crisis, COVID crisis. So hibernation, it is one of the popular and common strategy that they are taking. So now the question from Daryl is that, would you recommend struggling startups to take this path when they, as they go through the pandemic? And if yes, under what circumstances would it be the right strategy for them? If not, why not? Oh, this is a hard one. Um, uh, okay. Um, 
I think uh, if I look at what we've been advising a lot of our portfolio companies and, and, and looking at it, I think a lot of our, a number of our companies have had to actually put the foot on the, the brake and actually slow down. That means like reducing salaries, actually letting go of some people and reducing, um, uh, reducing their headcount. I, I think the, the, what, what you've always got to be very careful of is if you go into hibernation, and if you're in hibernation for, which basically means you've got literally the founders and maybe like one employee or something along that line and you kind of like stop doing anything. The problem with that, it's very hard to restart. It's very hard to then go out and raise further funding. It's very hard to actually get everything back moving again. So I, I, I don't, I would never advise you to go purely in hibernation and stop doing everything. I, I would advise to, reduce the burn as much as you possibly can look at ways that you could potentially uh get revenue in the door maybe doing other things cutting costs get, you know one company is is loan is kind of renting out part of their tech team to to another company to support them so they can still pay payroll with the idea that you know for founders the big one of the hardest things actually is to build that team um, and letting them all go and then having to restart it again so I'm, I'm against going into hibernation, um, you know, because the other problem is if you go to an investor and said, look, we will have this traction and then we've stopped everything. We haven't done anything for a year. And, you know, now, we, but we now need to raise money to start off. It's, it's a very difficult yeah. conversation to have. But, I think if you've, sorry, well, yeah. No, no, but, but it depends on the industry, right? I mean, if you are in an industry where there's absolutely no revenue, would you still say no hibernation or would it be a little bit dependent on what you're doing? Well, if you look at, if you look at some of our portfolio companies, which have lost all of their revenue, none yeah. of them have actually gone hundred percent into hibernation. What, where, what a number of them have actually done is they've reduced a lot of their BD team and they're just saying that we're just going to focus on actually building out the technology. And in some ways they actually see it as an advantage yeah. um, because they, they, they can actually focus you know, their team is much more, they can actually focus and they've identified opportunity for their customers that when they come out, they know their customers are going to have to change the way that they work. Yeah. So they're very much focusing on, on adapting their technology to that. Yeah. On other on a couple of our companies, um, what they've done, so we've got a company in, uh, which is the event space. So they've lost 100% of the revenue. No, no events are happening. They're actually taking this time to actually build their pipeline, build the relationships, um, get a number of big contracts actually on board. So when things open up, they can actually um, uh, expand rapidly. And they're probably having conversations with people that they wouldn't have been able to have a chance to before because they would have been too busy. So I agree with Will. It, it does depend on the thing. But at no point in time have they said, look, because there's no events, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to wait for a year. Um, reduce the team they're actually trying to find um, how they can actually still develop the business reduce the costs um, and that when things do pick up again that they're, they're at the cusp so they can ride the wave as well whenever that actually is I, I would like to add Michael if it's okay uh, yeah we had we advise companies to find ways to survive until the end of Q2 next year uh, every investor I think uh, gives different advice to their portfolio companies we we tend to take quite a conservative approach um if you have no other way to survive till the end of q2 2021 then going into some kind of hibernation for a limited time i think that probably that's what uh we would advise though but of course trying to keep things going as much as possible it depends a lot on the cash situation in your company the main objective for you is to not run out of cash another kind of cheeky point though is that if you are a founder with two really competent uh, co-employees or first employees. Uh, this might also be the time to distribute shares more fairly. Uh, it's good. It's a good starting point, perhaps, to talk about how should we go on without salary or with significant discounts in salary, and then compensate those key people you cannot lose, right, with actually making them into co-founders. Uh, that's, that's something we always strive to to make happen so that things are fair in the beginning that's something that often doesn't happen or is not the case and uh, by doing that first of all you protect your company against losing really key people 
And secondly, you protect against future conflicts because when a conflict becomes successful, any kind of things that were unfair from the beginning, you know, they tend to pop up and create trouble. So this could be a good way to kind of house clean and fix your cap table as well. I think one final point is a number of our companies didn't have enough funding uh, to get through until the second quarter of next year. So uh, we, you know, open communication with the investors and saying, this is a situation we're in. Can we just raise, it doesn't have to be a big round. It could be 50, it could be 100K that you go out and fundraise with a very clear plan. And so if you just sell that, if you say this is just purely for survival, I, th I think most investors won't actually uh, get excited about it. But if you can go to them and you can say, actually, we've seen this opportunity. Um, we just need to raise 100 k so we can keep things going and we're going to develop this idea so when things get better. Actually, we've seen across the board that that has actually got a lot um, of investors. I think for a small amount of money, it's worth it's worth taking the risk, but you've got to sell it as this, there's an opportunity at the end, not just this is purely so we can keep the lights on and we're not, we're going into hibernation. All right, thank you, Michael. So we're running out of time. So do you guys have any closing statement that you would like to say to your audience? Hmm. I, I would just say that we, we know how tough it is to run the startup or in, in, in general, and of course, this is extremely much more difficult now during a pandemic and global recession like this. So I would just say, keep exploring ideas for how to stay alive, keep reaching out, feel free to contact us as well. If you have specific questions, we are happy to help portfolio or non-portfolio. Uh, always happy to share our experiences. As Michael said, we've been through two recessions already uh, and, and seen how we came out of those. So, so Hope this was a useful session for you. Yeah. I'd just like to add, look, it looks all bad now, but through every kind of, um, through all diversity, there's always that silver lining. I think it's really important to actually see how you can turn COVID-19 into your advantage going forward. And I think every single one of our portfolio companies have seen, seen opportunities. They're going through pain now, but there's opportunities at the, at the end of it because the way people are working uh, the way people need to become more efficient, actually, it's going to accelerate. So um, don't don't give up. It is tough, um, and you know, good companies will always find fundraising. So yeah, it might be a bit more difficult now. So you've got to either change your expectations, as Will may mentioned earlier, raise slightly smaller amounts, and just expect it to take slightly longer than expected, and take a bit more of your time to do um, than it did before. But there are people in investing. People will always back good deals, no matter how, how difficult the situation is out there. Yeah. And in addition to reaching out to people like us, also reach out to fellow co-founders in other companies, because they will also appreciate this, right? So you can even reach out to your competitors, you know, and um, there's always something to discuss and there's always ways to, to discuss things and it will be comforting for, for um, you know, everyone. So, so please share uh, your issues and, and reach out to support and I think that would really help. Yeah. And I'd like to say thank you to Anissa and uh, for, for everybody for setting this up for E27, um, for all your support, A, for the ecosystem and putting this all together. Uh, it's been really enjoyable. Thank you very much. Yeah. Likewise. Yes, thank you, Michael. That's been a highly engaging session. And I would also like to remind all the attendees that we have yet another interesting session coming up in the next week. This time is about the future of investing. So make sure you guys register and all the details will be on our site coming up soon. We will also send out a survey shortly after the webinar. So please take the time to let us know what are the topics that you want to hear and how we can basically improve uh, the webinar. We would also like to remind you about our contribution program where we publish thought leadership pieces by players in the Southeast Asian startup ecosystem. Please feel free to reach out to us on writers at p27.co to learn more about this program. And meanwhile, I would also like to remind all of you that we are also, of course, available on social media. And yeah, this is our, our Facebook and our Twitter. And so, yes, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Will and Michael, for the presentation. It's very uh, enlightening. And take care, everyone. Hope you are stay safe in this, this interesting time. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.